Hey all, Professor Heaton here. For this video, we're gonna walk through something you were assigned from my class, a short story by Flannery O'Connor. The name of the short story is called A Good Man is Hard to Find. Now, this is a really, really famous short story. In pretty much any anthology of short stories, American short stories, you are going to find this story. Several scholars regard it as maybe the greatest short story ever, and obviously that's incredibly subjective. Uh, but let's talk through the story and learn how we should think about it or at least interact with the questions that it raises. As always, this is just my take. So uh, as something that I stole from one of my literary heroes, George Saunders, take this as an open parenthesis. Everything I'm about to say comes after it, and then when I'm done, close parentheses, then afterwards you can just say, or so Heaton says. So take it with a grain of salt. This is just my take. I'm here to help you if you're feeling kind of stuck with the story uh, and need a new perspective to look at it. This is not to say that this is the way to interpret or interact with the story. These are just my thoughts, okay? So, A Good Man is Hard to Find is written by Flannery O'Connor. The book, which is a compilation of short stories called A Good Man is Hard to Find and Other Stories, published in 1955. So keep that in the back of your mind. But as you can see, when we start this story, we have this grandmother figure. And this grandmother figure, she's about to go on vacation with her son's family, Bailey, and there are two kids, or three kids rather, there's a baby as well. And, and Bailey's wife. And we know that the grandmother, she wants to go to a different place. She doesn't want to go to Florida. So she's trying to manipulate the family and bring them to a different place, right? Because she doesn't want to go to Florida. The family's been there before. She thinks they should go to Tennessee. And instead of outright telling Bailey these things, she tries to manipulate the situation by saying, well, the kids have been to Florida before, so why would you go there? It's a very passive way of communicating that, and, and I'm stereotyping here, that we often would kind of associate with a grandmotherly figure. So instead of outright telling us what you want, you speak about it in a roundabout way, right? So uh, we've got John Wesley and June Starr. These are the two kids, and they kind of serve as these funny little children who interact with the grandmother in a particular way. They're making fun of the grandmother because she's not gonna stay home. She has to be in the middle of everything. And these are the types of things that are going on. And at the beginning of the story, you kind of get this sense that it's characterized almost as a comedy, right? So you have this kind of outlandish grandmother who's manipulating her son, kids that are arguing. Uh, we see that the grandmother is hiding her cat in her valise in order to go on the trip because she's worried about the cat staying home and messing with the burners in the kitchen and getting asphyxiated. So she's overly concerned about death. In the midst of all this, it's important to know that she has read the newspaper and we know that there is this mysterious murderer who's kind of roaming uh, the, the country and is known as the misfit. And we see that the grandmother is incredibly concerned about the misfit. She's concerned about her cat. All these things that kind of interact and play off the idea of death are at the forefront of her mind. So we start the trip, um, we see that she's taking note of things like the mileage, which is kind of strange, some interesting characterization. But then we get this really interesting bit about how in the process of going on this trip, she dresses in a particular way. So it says this about the grandmother, her collars and cuffs were white organdy trimmed with lace and at her neckline, she had pinned a purple spray of cloth violets containing a sachet. In case of an accident, anyone seeing her dead on the highway would know at once that she was a lady, which is really interesting, right? Because if you think about it, if you're dead on the highway, who cares what you look like, right? Who cares what people think about you? But we know that for this grandmother, it's important to her that even in death, other perceive of her in a particular way, in, in this way, as a lady, right? So someone of high class, high stature, things like that. So throughout the trip, we're kind of getting some, uh, some setting description that's going on here. 
uh, John Wesley, the son, he says, let's go through Georgia as fast as we can so we don't have to look at it. And we get these kind of bits from the grandmother, which she says, if I were a little boy, said the grandmother, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way. Tennessee has the mountains and Georgia has the hills. So essentially correcting John Wesley for talking about his native state in such a way, right? Uh, and then she says this, In my time, said the grandmother, folding her thin, vein fingers, children were more respectful of their native states and their parents and everything else. People did right then. And you can kind of get this sense of older generations saying things like this. Back in my day, right? So this is kind of a refrain that we get from the older, gen older generations. And it's going to happen to us too, right? We're, we're going to say these things. Back in my day, X, right? So, and we see here that there is a sense of an emphasis of placing values on things that were, the way things used to be, as opposed to the way things are, however that may be. And then we get some really interesting characterization. Now, in order to preserve Flannery O'Connor's writing and the potency of it, I am actually going to read the words here. They are offensive, but understand this is not being written in such a way as to convey offense to the reader, but to characterize the grandmother as a particular type of person, okay? So we just get this idea from the grandmother who harkens back to how things used to be. And then she says, oh, look at the cute little pickaninny, she said and pointed to a Negro child standing in the door of a shack. Wouldn't that make a picture now, she asked. And they all turned and looked at the little Negro out the back window. He waved. He didn't have any britches on, June Star said. He probably didn't have any, the grandmother explained. Little niggers in the country don't have things like we do. If I could paint, I'd paint that picture, she said. The children exchanged comic books. Now, obviously, the language here is a little startling, and it should be, right? It should be, um, for modern readers especially. And thinking back to this being composed in 1955 would have had a different effect, but it still kind of carries that sense in, in the fact that, oh, wow, she's she just said that. And think about how these two ideas contrast. So we look at how she's preserving and valuing the way things used to be, the way she was growing up. And then we see this black child and she's commenting on how cute this child is. This child has no pants. So we get the implication that this child is living in kind of the sense of poverty and the grandmother thinks it's cute. And then she kind of results to a racial slur. Sorry for my notifications there resulting to a racial slur. And so we can see here that there's the, the contrast is showing us something about the way things used to be. So even if things were better at one point, what about them is better, right? So especially if we think hearkening back to the good old days, it always begs the question, well, good for who, right? So yeah, the 1950s or the 1940s or whatever might have been a great time for wealthy and middle-class white people, but who else, right? And it's a way that we are blinded to particular situations that are going on for people that are different from us, right? Us being whatever your intersection of identities is. And that's what's going on with the grandmother here. She's privileging her own identity over those around her, thinking back to the good old days. And keep in mind, this is the 1950s. This is not even post-civil rights movement. So this is definitely an issue that's very real. Okay. All right. So that's what's happening. They're going along this trip. We get this kind of quick glance to where the grandmother sees this graveyard. Mm -hmm. A little bit of foreshadowing that's going on there. She's making jokes, kind of making corny dad jokes, or I guess in this situation, they'd be uh, grandma jokes. She tells a story about this guy that she used to date named Mr. Edgar Atkins Tea Garden and how he used to carve his initials into a watermelon. And then we get more characterization of the grandmother and she expresses that she actually has regret that she didn't stay with Mr. Tea Garden because he wound up investing in Coca-Cola when it was very new, presumably made a ton of money and she lost out because she could have been a wealthy wife, right? So once again, we're realizing like values here seem a little bit askew. It doesn't feel quite in alignment with what we think is right. So modern conventions say that well, you should marry for uh, love and for a sense of fulfillment. And here we see that she's kind of looking back on the idea of marriage as something that should be maybe come about because of the financial rewards that come along with it. So once again, we get some interesting characterization of the grandmother and her values. 
So we stop at this place called the Tower for Barbecue Sandwiches, and we see that Red Sammy is kind of like the boss of this place. He's a veteran. So once again, we kind of get these kind of old traditional ideas. And I wouldn't just say old. I, I, veterans certainly carry a sense of respect in our um, in our country today, uh, or at least in my mind right now, they do. Uh, but something's really strange here, and this is a convention of the type of genre that Flannery O'Connor would write in called Southern Gothic. And lots of students kind of miss these elements because it just seems so outlandish that you read over it. So Red Sammy was lying on the bare ground outside the tower with his head under a truck, while a gray monkey about a foot high chained to a small chinaberry tree chattered nearby. There is a monkey in a tree nearby. So this is drawing our attention to kind of the weird and fantastical elements that are in the story and kind of foreshadowing different things that are going to come, right? So we see that she's talking with Bailey, wanting to dance. And, and I think it's important to note that Bailey, her son, definitely is not a huge fan of the grandmother here. Not a huge fan, which I think is important in understanding her character. Um, now, note this. This comes from Red Sammy, who's kind of running the story here. He says, you can't win, he said, you can't win. And he wiped his sweating red face off with a gray handkerchief. These days, you don't know who to trust, he said. Ain't that the truth? People are certainly not as nice as they used to be, said the grandmother. Two fellas coming here last week, Red Sammy said, driving a Chrysler. It was old, beat up car, but it was a good one. And these boys looked all right to me. Said they worked at the mill, you know. I let them fellas charge the gas they bought. Now, why did I do that? Because you're a good man, the grandmother said at once. Yes, I suppose so. Red Sam said as if he were struck by the answer. Now, take take into account what's going on here. So we have Red Sam who's interpreting these guys that come up in the Chrysler car as being good boys, right? They, they look good. So now we are kind of finding goodness in a particular value. And for Red Sammy, it is in the appearance of how these guys look and in the appearance of their car, right? So maybe the car looked kind of middle class or upper class so he could assume goodness within these characters and it doesn't say it explicitly in the story but the implications are well these guys never came back essentially they stole the gas and red sammy is saying well, why did i do that and then we see that the grandmother says because you're a good man so now goodness to the grandmother is associated with this kind of charity maybe helping others out charity so once again, keep thinking about what goodness means throughout the story and to particular characters. Now look at this next part. His wife brought the orders, carrying the five plates all at once without a tray, two in each hand and one balanced on her arm. It isn't a soul in this green world of gods that you can trust, she said, and I don't count nobody out of that. Not nobody, she repeated, looking at Red Sammy, implying she doesn't even trust Red Sammy, right? So the guy's own wife can't trust them. And so now we're brushing up the idea that has just been presented by the grandmother that Red Sammy is in fact a good person. Well, is he if his own wife doesn't even trust him? So maybe then these ideas of goodness don't exactly align with reality. That's something to keep in mind. So then start talking about the misfits, uh, how he's probably going to come there. The wife thinks that. And then Red Sammy says this, and once again, just as a trick of all literature, if someone is about to mention the name of the story, stop, read it again, think about it. A good man is hard to find, Red Sammy said. Everything is getting terrible. I remember the day you could go off and leave your screen door unlatched. Not no more. And it, it, can't you hear your parents saying that? I, like, I grew up in a time where you didn't lock the door and you could just run down the street. So. We do have that type of sentiment that always kind of comes from older generations, that times used to be better, they were better, but now I guess evil people are lurking about. So he and the grandmother discussed better times. The old lady said that in her opinion, Europe was entirely to blame for the way things were now. So the problem with our country, it's not us, right? It's those other people. Sound familiar, right? She said the way Europe acted, you would think we were made of money and Red Sam said it was no use talking about it. She was exactly right. The children ran outside into the white sunlight and looked at the monkey. There it is again in the Chinaberry tree. So there's that monkey again. Now we see more manipulation from the grandmother trying to get us to this, this house. 
that we know actually isn't in Georgia, but winds up being in Tennessee. And she manipulates the situation by lying to her grandchildren, saying there's like this secret panel or like secret door that's there. And so the kids obviously try to overwhelm their father and succeed in doing so and getting them to go to this particular house. Uh, and this you will find is where the big crash happens, right? So there, the cat jumps and grabs Bailey's neck and he freaks out and they wreck. And ultimately we have this big accident and this is where the story really starts to kind of come wheels off, right? Uh, and we see this from the grandmother after um, she says, we've had an accident. The grandmother was curled up. Actually, the children were shouting, we have an accident under the dashboard, hoping she was injured so that Bailey's wrath would not come down on her all at once. So the grandmother is actually hoping here that she's hurt to avoid the wrath of her son, Bailey, right? So the kids, in a kind of funny way, they're upset that it's just a crash and no one's hurt, right? So there's some, you get a little bit of kind of humor that's going on there. And then off in the distance, they see this hearse, like big black, automobile hearse obviously which is like those funeral cars that hold coffins so it's approaching with three men in it okay now for the uh sake of time we're going to stop there so this is part one and if you want to watch part two that is coming shortly it'll be attached to this this uh, message as well unless you're just watching this on youtube uh, so be on the lookout for part two and i will send it your way